everybody, don't be shy, grab your seats. We have some seats up here at the front as well as we continue on our next track, which is all about the future of transportation. And um, starting in the stars at space, talking about connectivity, talking about we can build the infrastructure right through from space to connect the whole world and facilitate this digital revolution that we're living. Now we're gonna take a slightly different turn and talk about how we're actually moving around the world today. Every single day, things are more connected. We're more globalized. Everybody feels that little bit closer with communication technologies, but also with improvements in mobility. And, and this next speaker I'm really excited to have here in Las Ventas. And this technology first conceptualized by Elon Musk, who's a trend through the summit and is a pioneering entrepreneur himself and, and somebody we greatly admire. And this company are trying to materialize on those technologies, making the future a reality, which is a theme for the program today. And I love seeing the images of the technologies and the transportation devices these guys are building, because it kind of reminds me of the Jetsons, right? In little pods and capsules, they're flying around with on those futuristic type science fiction cartoons that we grew up with. And this is really what South Summit is about. It's about putting vision into reality, about turning dreams and ambitions into reality. And this speaker is definitely following that track, and that's why we're so excited to have him here. So without further ado, I pass the stage to Dirk Alborn, CEO of Hyperloop. See? Okay. Hola Madrid. <laughs> so we had Steve Wozniak, the president of Spain, Gwen Shotwell, no pressure. <laughs> All right, so we are Hyperloop Transportation Technologies and we are building the Hyperloop. So who here doesn't really know what the Hyperloop is? All right, awesome. So we have a little video that shows how this all started, what's happening right now, and uh, what's about to come. So I think that's a great introduction, and um, enjoy. America's always been a nation of doers. We build things, we take risks, and we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Billionaire philanthropist Elon Musk has hinted at a new high-speed transport system that could put planes and trains out of business. I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan? Move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel? It's something like that, yeah. Here's how he teased the idea in May at an All Things D conference. It's a cross between a Concorde and a railgun. It's called the Hyperloop. It's a system of giant suspended tubes. Riding within are capsules carrying people or freight traveling on cushions of air at speeds of up to 1,200 k's per hour, or roughly one kilometer every three seconds. A tube that would be on pillars from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and inside there would be capsule cars that would be rocketed forward up to 700 miles an hour, and that there would be a fan on the front. Elon Musk basically says that this is the way of the future. How do you like something that uh, can never crash? Mm -hmm. um, it is immune to weather. It goes uh, three or four times faster than the, 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 the sort of bullet train, and it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket. It will only cost to build this six or seven billion dollars. Oh. Compare that to the 65 billion for the current high-speed rail plans for California. He believes this is a viable, valuable alternative for mass transit between these two destinations. Could something like the Hyperloop actually be the answer to super-fast, environmentally friendly, high-speed travel between our busiest cities? So the gauntlet has been thrown down. A design document for a whole new, super-cool way to travel. The only thing now, will someone pick it up and make the Hyperloop a reality? There are some companies that, have, that are forming to try to make the Hyperloop happen, and uh, I, 
encourage them. I think that's that's great. Um, I'm super focused on Tesla and SpaceX and to, to you know small amount on Solar City. So that that basically completely uses up my my brain. Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The only resistance would be the air in front of the capsule, which uh, we move to the back by using a compressor. The company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. Dirk Alborn says it's safer and more efficient than the railroad. Well, the system is complete, completely computerized, so um, you, know, you optimize the system and then you actually have the humans to monitor it. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system. We're completely managed by a computer system. There's no human factor that can actually create those issues. We actually plan on uh, seeing the first Hyperloop very, very soon starting. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane, actually. Obviously, for us, it's very important to make it as a good of an experience as possible. So This is an independent organization that has formed. We have 170 engineers, scientists, and uh, really great professionals mm -hmm. with amazing backgrounds. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods, known as the Hyperloop, is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5, with construction set to begin in 2016. Let's bring in Dirk Alburn, who is the man who runs the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies team, which is announcing this deal with Quay Valley, California. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. That's um, when we will be start um, working on our development. So we will be starting ground uh, at the same time. Uh, we, at this moment, we expect to be done by 2018. Hyperloop now appears one step closer to reality. Starting next year, that theory will turn into a groundbreaking in Quay Valley, Kings County off of I-5. A developer there has just committed a big chunk of his private land toward the project. It's a five-mile loop that would take visitors through a planned entertainment district. That's going to be a test track. Elon Musk has announced that he's going to build a small-scale test track. It's a necessary step for us to be building a full-scale version, and um, Quay Valley is a sustainable model town of the 21th century, so it's a perfect fit. They're expecting over 10 million uh, visitors per year, so we will actually be able to re generate revenues very, very fast. The company plans to go public later this year. We want to do a public offering. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. We want to make sure that um, the people that have been helping building um, the company and this technology are able to um, participate in, in, in the investment and in the fundraising and the upside of the company. With their contributions to Hyperloop, these students from around the world now have stock options in the company, but they say they're not in it for the money. As a student, I start to feel like um, I'm in, uh, in part of a, some great career that might change the world. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies. And it's the right time. It's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. Do you think this is possible? This is not just? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. For all those who said this is just a neat little thing <laughs> to draw on a cocktail napkin, these guys are saying it will become reality. All right. So those were two years basically put together in um, five minutes. So just to reiterate, what is the Hyperloop? Imagine a capsule filled with people hovering inside a tube and moving really, really fast. Inside this tube, we create a low-pressure environment. So very similar to an airplane that goes into high altitudes, this capsule encounters very little resistance and can therefore go very fast with very little energy. 
This is probably the most important part. It's completely green. We use wi uh, solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, in some cases even geothermal. So the system produces more energy than it's actually using. So why is this so important? Well, first of all, we have to move over to green energy, right? But uh, there's a problem. Public transportation doesn't work. Why? Because public transportation, the moment we do an investment, it's a liability. We have to continuously put money into it. As an example, when you take the metro in Los Angeles, Every time someone takes a metro, two, the taxpayers have to pay $2.50. $2.50 every time someone takes a metro. So we are a startup company. One of the first things that we looked at uh, is, is this a business model? Thanks to the alternative energy we're using, and our operational costs are so low that we can be profitable within eight years on something like LA to San Francisco. Oops, let's see if it comes. There you go. The system is on pylons, um, which has a couple of advantages. Once, it's uh, cheaper to buy the land because you don't have to buy large chunks, right? You don't need the land where the pylon is on, ideally. Um, it also has the advantage that it doesn't go through the land in a way that you now farmers have to go, have to figure out how to get on the other side, right? Normally they tell them, well, you just trade it with your neighbor. The problem is most of the time neighbors don't really get along. So in this case, you still can go under it. But we can also integrate the latest technology to make it earthquake safe. The latest building technology can be integrated. So probably in case of an earthquake, you'd rather be on a hype, in a hyperloop than on the street. Capacity is always an issue, so we're actually looking at uh, being able to add several tubes. For us, capacity, it's great. I mean, if we have that problem, that means we're making a lot of money, and we just want to add a couple of more lines. But how are we going to do this? This is actually the part that I'm personally most passionate about, because it's an amazing story. So, I'm sure you all know these companies. They all have something in common. They're all failures. Sorry for the, all the BlackBerry users, I know. They still have a chance, but... Um, so then, there's these companies. They all have something in common as well. All these companies encountered difficulties in their lifespan and switch to something called crowdsourcing. Some of these companies have more than 50% of the innovation coming from the outside. In the case of Lego, for example, Lego was almost bankrupt. Switched the CEO, the CEO integrated crowdsourcing, and today it's one of the most successful toy companies out there. So, when we started out, I was part of a nonprofit incubator that was funded by NASA, and we were looking at new, new ways of creating companies by building communities around ideas and technologies in order to make them into successful businesses. We wanted to build a better way on how you can create a business. Today, everything's online. You can find um, your boyfriend, girlfriend online. You can order your food. You can get your laundry. Everything's online, but when it comes to creating a business, most of the time it's still you and a buddy with a beer in a bar. And somehow you start. But what if you would have 100 people, 1,000 people, that give you their honest feedback, give you their ideas, give you their connections, that help you? You can build a smarter company. So this is the concept. When Elon Musk proposed the, the Hyperloop, he actually said that he didn't have the time to do this and wanted someone else to pick it up. We reached out to SpaceX, asked for permission to put it on. The community was excited. But what got me excited was that not only did they say, hey, you guys should do this, they said, hey, I want to do this. There's so many people that wanted to do this project, that we, we formed the company, we created a small team, and basically said, everybody who would like to join and work in exchange for stock options in the company, please apply. 
We had more than 200 applications. Got a team together of around 100 engineers and started working on the feasibility study. Today, we're more than 450 people that are working in this company. Some of the largest companies in the world. I'll tell you a little bit later about it. So we're using something that we call crowdstorming. Normally, these kind of projects, when they're building a train, a metro, they're done behind closed doors. You don't really know anything about the project. Maybe you have heard how much it's going to cost, but that's all you really know. So we ask. We want to crowdstorm. So we ask things like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket really the best way to monetize? Because if we can find a way to make more money the more the passenger rides, then a ticket would actually be something negative. Right? Then you would use it, this ticket to regulate demand. Or things like, what are we going to do with the pylons? I mean, in, in a project like this, it's billions of dollars of pylons. So normally, they're just like, OK, well, the pylon holds a tube up. It has to be there. For us, we're a company. We want to really think about, hey, what can we do? So, you know, so we ask the question, if I give you 200 pylons, what are you going to do with it? And just asking this question is already enough. Because there's some crazy ideas, some very genius ones that come out. So from creating vertical gardens, having beehives inside the pylons, being able to actually use the pylons to generate water, which we're still working on it, but in my opinion is actually possible with the same infrastructure we're having. Some really amazing ideas come. So we're not alone building the Hyperloop. We have finished our feasibility study end of 2014. And now there's other companies. There's actually a company very similar to us called Hyperloop Technologies. And they're not going to be the only ones. But is this model we're doing really working? And that's the interesting part I think we will see in the future here. So what are the differences? Right? So we have been out there for two years now. We're getting ready to build the first full-scale Hyperloop. Our team is working all over the world in exchange for, uh, for stock options. We have some of the largest companies that are involved. And believe me, we are moving very, very fast in development and making our products always bigger and better. On the other side, we have a normal company, venture capital funded, 30, 40 people. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this all moves forward. So why am I telling you this? Obviously, first of all, if you want to join, I want you to join the right company, right? But it's also important to see that these things are possible. So this, how many are entrepreneurs here? Awesome. So one of the first things that comes always in mind is I need money. I have to raise funds. But you actually can do amazing things without money. Money is not the most important thing, and we approve. Until today, we actually haven't raised any funds. So this is a map that we used in one of our crowdstorming activities. A lot of people thought that this shows the best routes. It actually doesn't. It shows some of the obvious routes, and then it shows some of the routes that we thought were interesting, and we wanted to get some feedback on. So just because we were, just because we had Albuquerque, which is right next to Las Vegas and Phoenix, on there, we were three times on TV in Albuquerque. And people in Albuquerque were like, a Hyperloop in Albuquerque? Why? What would it do? And that's exactly what we wanted. We were there listening to all the discussions, getting all the feedback, and really validating our assumptions. But what this map also shows is what the Hyperloop really is. It's a metro system. It's a metro system that connects metropolitan areas. So we're using it for large metropolitan areas that are overflowing, but not only. It's also a system that works for inner city transport. 
So now you have something that brings you very fast from Los Angeles to San Francisco, 36 minutes, that's great, but if it still takes you an hour and a half to get to the station, you haven't really solved anything. So we're looking at the first and last mile as well. So it has to be as easy as pushing a button, right? A self-driving car, an Uber, a Lyft, a cab comes and picks you up, brings you to a local Hyperloop station, the metro station, which brings you to the main station, and now you're up in San Francisco within 50 minutes from wherever you are. That's our goal, because we want to build something that you use every single day, several times, ideally, and not only something that you use once a month. So our community right now, we have more than 10,000 people in our community that are crowdstorming with us, they're actually almost 20,000. We have more than 450 top professionals, and these are not just a couple of guys in a chat room. These people are working with at least 10 hours a week on the project. They're earning the stock options. We have the professor of psychology of Stanford University. We have people that brought the Mars rover on Mars. We have even a guy that what was part of the Manhattan Project and invented the insulin pump as part of our team. We have social media PR guys. We have amazing companies that are part of what we're doing. We have AECOM, which is the largest construction engineering firm in the world. We have Earlycon, which is the inventor of vacuum pump technologies. And um, I don't know, they did a little project called the CERN Hydrogen Collider. So they have some experience with tubes and vacuum. And they're all part of our team. Everybody on our team is passionate about what they're doing. They're not doing this for money. They're doing this because they want to change the world. They want to make it a better place. Because Traveling sucks. I think traveling is terrible. It used to be something you were looking forward to. Now, I mean, if you have to go somewhere, if you have to go, let's say, to Milan from Madrid, right, you don't really look forward to the traveling. You look forward to getting to Milan, but the travel experience, that's, uh, that's, that's not what you want. Why is this important? Um, so we are in 21 nations, and I think that our model is a model that, that works the best. Because this idea is nothing new. It has been around since 1870. In 1904, there was a first patent for a vacuum tube. In 1969, the US government actually had two projects. Switzerland did, some, did something called the Swiss Metro. And all of these failed. But they didn't fail because they're not technically viable. They all failed because they're localized, they depend on governments. If we would want to do this in America, and only in America, it would take 30 years if we're lucky, if you have to really work with all the regulations. But we have the whole world. And there's places in this world that they need a solution right now. I just came back from China, Beijing. There's 50 million people. You want me to cut down? OK. All right, I got it. We're gotta... so excited about this opportunity. We want to open up the conversation because um, we have a star studded panel, Dirk. So I am going to invite them to the stage. Can we please get the panelists up for the next session? Dirk, thank you so much. All right, thanks.